Hello there, friends. Welcome back. I have a couple of items here. It's a, a film camera. the primary way that my family and I took pictures before we started using digital cameras. couple of zoom lenses for it as well. You know, I'm, I'm struck sometimes by the way the brain makes connections from idea to idea, topic to topic. You know, we were talking in the last video about a mixing board at a famous recording studio out in California and talking about the idea of how much talent and creativity were, in a sense, witnessed by that board over the years. And it got me thinking about the phrase that we've all heard um, that goes something like, if these walls could talk, what stories they would tell. And that thought kind of led me directly down the road to cameras, particularly film cameras it led me down the road to thinking about these these cameras and these these lenses and wondering you know, what if these lenses could talk what stories would they tell got me thinking a lot about the days when we would use this camera, when we would drag it along to vacations and early trips we uh, took when the kids were young. And uh, 
and how much of a, uh, a relative commitment it was to to bring a device like this along to capture our adventures compared to nowadays when unless you're a you know a hobby photographer a serious photographer or a professional anymore so much photography happens right on our phones which we have with us all the time anyway just reminds me of how how different it was to have a specialized dedicated piece of mechanical technology like this to do that job. This was uh, given to us very generously years and years ago as a gift from a, a dear friend. And for quite a few years, we, uh, we took it wherever we went. It's been in its case and on a shelf for a lot of years, but when I got it out recently, I was reminded I'm kind of surprised I forgot about this, but I was reminded that it makes a couple of amazing sounds. Two of my favorite sounds, in fact, come from a film camera like this. One is the, the shutter release sound, the, the sound when the actual picture is taken and one is the film advance sound which is the sound that you get by advancing this lever right here but the camera of course had not had any real film in it for many years and the battery that uh, it uses was very weak and in particular for the film advance sound it really needs a canister of film loaded into it to really get that full effect of the sound that I love because it's not only the sound of the cameras advancing mechanism, but it's also the sound of the film being pulled out of the canister that adds such a such a texture to that sound. So as I was handling this camera I thought, you know, that might be a, that might be a fun topic. So went to the store, a couple of different stores, got a new battery, that I thought we could install here in the video, but a little more surprisingly, I was impressed to discover that you can still buy 35 millimeter film at the uh, local big box department store. Uh, Walmart is where I found this. You could buy 200 and 400 speed film there. 
And so I thought to get the full effect, we could put the new battery in and put a roll of film in and let her rip. All the while musing about the scores of cameras, probably just like this one and similar that are sitting in closets across the world, collecting dust, while all those family pictures are now being taken, and very well, I, I, I'll add, by, by our phones and our digital cameras. So we'll look at these big zoom lenses a little more closely here in a bit. But let's set those to the side for a moment. Take a look at what we have here. This is a, a Canon AE-1 program. This camera was first made in 1981, although I don't, I don't know when this particular one was made. You can always tell devices that are well used by me and my family because they invariably have a little bit of damage over time. Because, well, we just, you know, we handle things enough, we eventually drop things. On this camera, you can see a little impact damage right on that corner. And similarly, right here. And when we look at uh, one of the zoom lenses, we'll see some damage as well. This is uh, just the stock 50 millimeter non-zoom lens that I presume would have come with the camera if the camera was bought with a lens. You know I love lid sound. That's a good sound right there. This camera had a uh, computer program in it that would let it um, operate in an automatic mode. As long as the lens that you were using was positioned with the A right there on top. And this little dial here was set to program. Then you could operate the camera essentially as a big fancy point and shoot, which is what I did most of the time because I wasn't really a photographer. You point it at your subject. You still have to focus manually, of course, but it would set the shutter speed and the aperture size automatically based on the light it was sensing. And uh, it would calculate from there. You could also put it into a, uh, a shutter priority mode by selecting a shutter speed on this dial, but leaving the lens in the A position means that it would pick the appropriate aperture size to get the right exposure. Or if you took the aperture ring off of A, then you're back to a full 
manual mode where you pick the shutter speed and you pick the aperture size. I'm a little embarrassed to say that for having such a nice piece of serious photographic equipment, I never really was uh, any good at that. I, I take I take better, more arguably artistic photos with my phone now than I ever did with the with the good old AE one. I didn't know anything about depth of field or rules of thirds or composition at all back in these days. I just I just pointed it at things. Also, I got this poor, tired strap. But this is a camera strap because you can see these three little areas here. The stitching is spaced so that you can put spare film canisters in the straps. So I, I'd like to do a little before and after kind of a sample here. We'll try the we'll try the shutter sound with the 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 nearly dead battery in it so we can compare it to the sound it makes when the good battery is in it. sound. See, I don't think we're actually getting our full selection of shutter speeds with this dying battery in it. Because that that shutter at 1 250th of a second sound exactly the same as the 1,000th of a second and they should sound different. thing we're hearing of course is the that film advance sound but we'll compare that to the sound later too because this sound this advanced sound is only half of the sound it, it, it's definitely missing something and what it's missing is having an actual roll of film loaded. Because part of the sound is the pulling of the film out of the canister, the, re the resistance that you feel in this lever when you're, you're pulling against actual film. It's not the same as this more empty kind of a sound. So, let's see about this. So the battery
goes in this little door here. Or behind it, rather. There it is. There's the battery compartment. This is a little Kodak lithium battery. It's a six volt battery. 28L is the model. You can still find replacements. And if I'm not mistaken, I read the old owner's manual correctly. This battery is the same, the same cross section as a popular uh, little button battery that's used for watches. And you can actually take a stack of three of those little watch batteries and put them in this compartment, and that will work to power the camera as well, if I'm not mistaken. Just brush the dust away a little bit. Now let's see about this. So here's a Duracell version of a 28L battery. Looks like the package design is the same. This is the positive end. We can see our little little picture or a little key inside the battery compartment showing the plus and the minus. So we will install accordingly. Or maybe it will fight me because it knows the camera is on. <laughs> so there he is. All right. So with just that change, let's see if we can hear a difference in the uh, shutter speed behavior.
Hmm. It is possible that the amount of available light hitting the lens and the fact that we're set to a fairly low speed, 200 speed, which is one of the least sensitive film speeds, means that we won't get that full super quick shutter that we're looking for. Might have to bring the camera outside for that. But what about the film itself? Well, let's put these guys to the side. and see what we get with a new package of 200 speed Fujifilm. See, they make a point here of calling out that uh, this low, lower speed film is really only good for bright sunlight and flash conditions. You're not going to take low light pictures with 200 speed film. It'll, it'll come out too grainy because it's not a very sensitive film. Now it strikes me when I look at this camera and thinking about film again, it strikes me how deliberate the activity of taking pictures used to be. I mean, with my phone, you know, I've always got it with me and if it has a decent amount of memory on the phone, I can take as many pictures as I want of as many things as I want. I can take 40 pictures of a flower from different angles if I want to, and then delete all the ones that I don't want to keep or keep them all. There's, there's not a lot of downside. But with film, You know, you'd have a roll of 12 or 24 or 36 exposures in the camera. And then you'd shoot those pictures and you'd wind it back up and then you'd have to take that canister someplace to get them developed into prints. It was a multi-step process, so you weren't going to take 40 pictures of the same flower if you were shooting film, at least not as a, not as just a family guy, you know, just taking pictures for fun. If you were a serious photographer, you might do something like that as you're honing your skills or whatever, but... It was too expensive to uh, to do that for me. So you only really raised that camera and pointed it at that subject when you were serious about that moment. That that there's something about that moment that needed to be captured, you know. And that's and I guess that's why I started thinking about these cameras when I thought about the phrase if these walls could talk. Because if you were present and in the moment with a, with a film camera, you know, you generally brought that thing up to your face because you wanted to capture something that 
had value to you that you really wanted to capture. And that makes me think that uh, some of those poor cameras collecting dust in uh, closets all over the world might have really been witness to some amazing things. So the film, as you might guess, goes into the back of the camera here. And we access that with the little little device here on the left. This whole back is a hinged door that opens like so. So you can see that the film advance lever over here turns this little uh, slotted contraption on the right that you uh, insert the end of the film in and it turns and pulls it along and then there's a little guide here with little sprockets on the ends that uh, help pull the film as well by putting these little sprockets in the holes along the edges you see So to load this, canister goes on this side, the film gets drawn across here because of this area is the window that opens up to expose the film with light when the shutter is open right here. I'm not going to touch any of that with my fingers. So the film gets pulled across. started in one of the slots right there and the sprockets are in the holes here see that advancing the lever there pulls the film along and it starts wrapping around right there. So now we have film in the camera, which means now you should be able to hear the sound in its full glory. And hopefully the difference is not so subtle that you won't be able to hear it in this video. It's possible it'll just sound the same, but hopefully not. Hopefully you'll notice a difference. Let's see. Let's see what happens.
Yeah, to me, that is the, uh, that's the real sound right there because it has both components. And not just sound, there's a physical, there's a tactile aspect to this too as you're pulling that advanced lever across and you're feeling, you can feel the, the action in the entire camera. You can feel it in both hands, that, that film being pulled out. It's a very satisfying experience. four exposures in them. So that has to do with the length of the film that's rolled up in that canister. They're saying that uh, if you load it properly, you should be able to get at least 24 exposures out of that roll of film. Here's the empty canister that we can then insert in the strap like that. Then it would wait for the roll to be finished and then you would put it back in there and replace it. These cameras are just an absolute buffet of amazing sounds. Do any of you have a phone, uh, an app, a camera app on your phone that mimics the shutter release sound when you take a picture? to take a picture of the microphone. <laughs> now the lens that I remember using the most often when we were out on our adventures is this one. This is a zoom lens. This is a 28 to 80 millimeter zoom lens. The zoom ring is right here. It's easy to tell that this lens was the most used because you can see in this there's a there's like a filter ring that I've got screwed onto the outside here and right here you can see that a part of the ring is dented Then you can also see a dent right there where the lens or the camera was dropped at 
some point. lens on the camera body and see uh, see how that goes there we go this is the configuration I would have used most often when shooting cover bridges or the various small towns that we might have been traveling to. This is a very hefty, kind of chunky affair compared to the modern phones that we take so many pictures with now. That's what I mean when I talk about commitment. You brought, you brought this chunk of metal and glass up to your eye. It's because you really wanted that picture. You really wanted the thing in front of you to uh, get captured for posterity. Again, even on this lens, you can see the little A right there. This whole series of lenses that were made to work with the AE-1 would have to have an A there to represent that it could function in automatic mode. Yep. I remember this. The uh, this lens has a very satisfying focus uh, grip. This whole this whole part of the lens turned when you focused. You know, the focuser on the 50 millimeter is much smaller. Well, everything is smaller with the 50. But then, if you keep going with that concept, you, uh, you take it to more of an extreme, you get a lens like this. This is also a zoom lens. This is the uh, 80 to 200 millimeter zoom. And this is a crazy, this is a crazy hunk of glass right here. In contrast to this lens, I hardly ever used this. There was just no, the kind of stuff that I would shoot, there was not much practical reason to pull out a lens like this. It's obviously great for bringing things far away things up close, but we can see when we put this guy on the body,
this is just a, a huge contraption now. Very heavy. That much harder to hold steady if you're shooting with a, uh, a really sensitive film and, and very high shutter speeds. Just, uh, just way more camera than, uh, than any of us ever needed. It's cool and all, but uh, this lens did not see a lot of use. We eventually we eventually bought a little power shot digital camera like this one. And the convenience the ability to uh, not have to process prints uh, really, you know, ended up taking the place of our trusty AE-1. If we were more serious photographers, that might not have been the case, but we just snap shots of, you know, things that we did, and so the, the, uh, the portable digital solution pretty much meant that the uh, AE-1 got put in its case and uh, put on the closet shelf and uh, hasn't been out much since. And of course, nowadays we don't even use these power shots anymore because everything happens on the phone. And, you know, the phone apps do make it even easier to take, you know, really nice looking pictures compared to the core photographic concepts that you really had to understand to make good use of uh, a camera like this and not just have it in automatic mode all the time. But I find that handling this camera again after so long does, does remind me how how much I appreciate the intent, the intentional aspect of photography when I was using something like this. I absolutely appreciate the convenience of what I use today, but uh, it is so easy to shoot throwaway pictures nowadays. Back when we were buying film and processing film, You didn't want to take throwaway shots.
you'd get a little annoyed every time the pictures would come back from developing and there was a missed shot or a, an accidentally overexposed uh, frame, something like that. That means you, uh, you know, wasted one of the uh, exposures out of your roll of 24. And that was annoying, you know, you didn't want to do that. That's uh, pretty much all gone now. And that's fine. Not everything that uh, we used to do is uh, deserving of being uh, preserved necessarily. I certainly don't advocate that. But it was cool to see this guy again. Do you ever feel like uh, an inanimate, inanimate object kind of has a vibe of a trusted companion about it? That's what I feel when I see this again. Do you ever use a tool so much that it just kind of becomes part of you? You can rely on it. It's reassuring to use because it, uh, it's so familiar after a while. That's how I felt with this, I think. I do wish I had learned more about the ins and outs of photography when I was working with a uh, piece of gear like this, but that's not really where my interests were. But in terms of uh, an excuse to go back down through memory lane, this uh, This camera fits the bill very nicely. I love having a, uh, a memento, a uh, little signpost along that uh, path to, uh, to remember those days by. Hopefully you have something similar. See if we can uh, get these protective caps back on. That one went on a lot easier than it usually does. from the past, the old trusty Canon AE-1 and lenses. Thanks for being with me today, friends. We'll look forward to uh, catching up with you next time, okay? Take care.